Tom Holland plays Danny Sullivan in the crowded room. I'm Matt Noble at Gold Derby. And I want to start things off by asking you, Tom, how did you find the truth in a character who finds uh, reality so confusing? Oof, wow. That's a tough question to start with early in the morning. <laughs> I think finding the truth was about... Um, really just focusing on Danny's core self and spending, I think we spent four episodes convincing the audience that his reality is our reality. That there's nothing special about it. It is just a troubled kid who's incredibly vulnerable, who is taking advantage of um, and who is suffering socially. So for us to really just dive into that and to have that amount of time to, to bring the audience with us and convince them that Danny's reality is the only reality. I guess is how we found the truth. And then as the show progresses, we start breaking down that reality slowly and then eventually we break it all down at once. So I guess it was just about being patient and really kind of biding our time to not trick the audience, but to get the audience to believe that his reality is just like yours or mine. Mm. And like, it, it means we go on his journey a little bit in terms of like our sense of reality shifts as his does, which is pretty cool. Yeah, because, you know, with any character I play, I always wanted to try and find a way where audience members can see themselves in the character. So those kind of earlier episodes where we were portraying Danny as this young, vulnerable kid who was getting picked on at school, who was struggling to fit in. Um, you know, the vast majority of people have experienced that at some point in their lives. So I wanted people to feel connected to him so that when the awful things happen to him and when the light really comes out of what he's been through, you suddenly find it really difficult to relate to him, but you empathize with him because you feel like you know him and you love him. Hmm. What was most important for you in playing Danny? I think the most important thing for me was something that Akiva um, was adamant about in, in the development process of this film, which was the responsibility of telling a story about mental health from a positive point of view. A film or a show that represents millions of people around the world that are unheard um, and to also serve as an education to people like myself who had no idea the powers of the human mind and what we can do to protect ourselves sometimes for good or for bad um so i think for me that responsibility was was pretty heavy um because i could just feel it in akiva's energy that he really wanted to to change the stigma against mental health so making sure this show was a positive representation of that was really important to us. Mm. Did you did you learn anything from sort of getting inside this character's head? I learned a lot about like my own resilience mm. um, and like what I can put up with, uh, which was, you know, it was really eye-opening. This was a really tough job for, for a multitude of reasons. Obviously the subject matter was really difficult, that portraying the character was really difficult, but then just the onset life was really tough. Shooting in New York, it's 10 episodes, it's four directors, it's, you know, moving around the city and it was COVID, it was tough. And there were times where I felt like I was gonna crack, but I didn't, I managed to sort of keep my head on. You know, I stayed focused and, and when there were problems, we solved them. We didn't kind of dwell in them. And I just really learned that I am far more resilient than I might have thought going into this project. Yeah. Can you, can, you, can you think of a moment of resilience that you had in shooting? I can, but I don't think I can share them because <laughs> they're, uh, yeah, I, I can't share those. That you know, as you know, I'm a producer now, I guess, and I have an obligation to the people that might have been creating those problems to keep those problems uh, to myself. That's fair. That's very fair. Uh, like, as an actor, you, like, have the job of inhabiting different roles and different characters. Right. Um, do, like, 
obviously Danny has different personalities that uh, he mm-hmm. has throughout the film as the series as well. Um, so was that sort of that you've been an actor and you've played different characters, was that helpful or is that a bit of a hindrance because it was like sort of similar but not the same? So we thought of approaching it that way in our prep stage. We were we were kind of thinking about how do we portray these other characters. Portraying Danny was the easy part. Mm. Like that was just a character that we developed and he was our truth. And, you know, I, I was going to find that relatively easy. But then playing the other actors, we were kind of toying with this idea of, shall I portray those characters as if Danny was pretending to be them? But the reality is, is Danny doesn't know that he's becoming them. So they needed to feel like um, main characters in their own right. They needed to all be number one on the call sheet. Um, so we are. Was it a hindrance? No. I was able to switch off, but pretending to act as them, as Danny, I guess, was something that we very quickly realised wouldn't work. Yeah. Did any, did any, like, with all this different stuff going on in Danny, did any sort of Tom creep in? Did any of you creep into this performance? I tell you, uh, you know what? It's really interesting. So whenever I break down a character, the first things that I do, sometimes subconsciously, but normally it's a conscious decision, is I'll go through a script and I'll pick out the moments that I feel like I relate to with the character. Moments where I feel like, oh, I, I do that anyway. Um, and then I build upon that. And that's how I feel like I make a character that's very kind of true to myself while, you know, representing different things. But with Danny and this show, I couldn't really find anything. So this, for me, when I see the show, it feels like the biggest departure from myself. I don't see any of myself in this character. You know, I have the crazy hair and the clothes and I think our production team did so well with with making um, it look like the 70s. So when I see this show, I really, really don't see myself in it at all. Oh, well, um, was that was that sort of freeing in a sense? It was it was freeing. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was really it's it's liberating to watch it it's quite scary when you're doing it because when you're portraying a character that you can really relate to or that you feel like you have a lot in common with it almost feels like you're kind of portraying a friend whereas Danny felt like a real stranger Mm. I feel like I didn't know him at all so it, it felt quite um unnerving at times but I had a great um friend of mine Ben Perkins who's my acting coach, he was with me on this project. He comes with me on the jobs where I really feel like I'm going to need the support. And he came with me and he was a, a lifesaver. We, we got through it together. Mm. In the series, Danny's first scene with Raya, um, she she um, lets him know that she's here to help. And there's a bit of a pause mm-hmm. before you say, okay. And so much of this series is the idea of trust. And it, mm-hmm. it, like, how much thought did you put into moments like that where there's like got to be a pause before as Danny's processing things and has to decide whether he wants to trust her or trust others in the show? Well, I mean, we were really lucky that uh, Jody, our script supervisor, and Akiva, uh, Jody was a clinical psychiatrist, and Akiva has a an extensive background in that field. So we had these two incredible resources on set to sort of talk to them about the process of therapy, what people like Danny do in those situations. So lots of those moments, pausing, um, you know, reacting in certain ways, shutting down or opening up, those were all um, conversations that we had with Jody and Akiva. I even remember like in the early, early drafts, Danny elected to speak about Adam and Adam's death in like one of our really, really early on interviews with, with Raya and Jody at this point, who's our script supervisor, we didn't know her very well. She sat Akiva down and basically said like, that wouldn't happen. And I really admired her for that because, you know, 
that's a brave thing to do early on to someone who spent two years writing some scripts. And to testament to Akiva's character is he he listened to her and he knew she was right and he changed and he changed the narrative. And I think it worked so much better the way Jody wanted it to. But back to your question, yeah, I just would rely on them and ask them questions about how would someone who's suffering from what my character's suffering from react in those situations. Yeah. And um, like, with with uh, operating, acting with Amanda, um, Amanda Seyfried, um, you have so many, like, scenes with her and just her in the film. What did you learn from her um, as a scene partner? <laughs> I guess what I learned from Amanda is I really learned how to like keep it fun and light. You know, what we were doing was dark and intense and and there was loads of dialogue and pages and pages of new dialogue. And, and we would we would do five or six scenes a day and it would just feel like this endless journey to tell this story. And it was really fun. It was really, really fun. Working with her was was a delight even in moments where the stuff we were doing was sad and emotional we still found time to laugh and and to talk and we were knitting and stuff and and having a, just a really good time so I, I'm I feel very uh, lucky and blessed that Amanda came on to do the show because she really did bring such a positive light to to the set mm. And I do think, like, even in sort of Spider-Man, which is sort of, like, more thought of as a, like, blockbuster-type film, I think, like, often your most sort of compelling and fun scenes are the ones when you're sort of maybe the quieter moments just with another actor. Um, mm -hmm. When you're in one-on-one -on -one scenes, how do you try to serve the person you're with? As in, like, how do I try and serve the scene partner? Yeah, like, how do you sort of, like, what do you offer to them or what are you, what, how are you sort of other mind um, when you're, when you're acting with another actor in a one-on-one -on -one scene? I don't really know, to be honest. I just make sure that I listen yeah. and like, you know, I, I really like working in an environment where people feel comfortable to like chop and change dialogue and, and to, to mix things up. So for me, it's just about listening and, and being focused and, you know, treating their coverage like my coverage. That's something that I've always been really adamant about. It really drives me crazy when you do a scene with someone and then when it comes to your coverage, they kind of just switch off. And there are people like that. Everyone's worked with people like that. And I just think it's really rude. Amanda is the complete opposite. You know, she gives you as much performance as she does on her own coverage. Um, I really learned that from Downey. I remember being on set with him early on in my, my Spidey days and He'll often do, he'll do, you'll do his coverage and then he'll come back to you to do your coverage and then he'll discover something so fantastic in your coverage because he's performing that much that you'll almost be like, we should go back and get more of his coverage. So I've always just really admired his way of working and kind of based my onset model off of him. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And like, is, is it like, because spider Man's such a different like sort of, tone than what you're doing in the crowded room and uh but sure. is anything from playing spidey that you've learnt that has helped you with any performance you approach yeah i think the thing that i've really taken from the whole spider-man experience is the ability to commit to questionable physicality you know on that first movie I was really nervous about whether or not I was doing too much in terms of the physicality of the character. As an actor, your face is kind of your superpower. So if you take that away and put someone in a mask, all of a sudden it's really difficult to, to emote and to perform. I was really lucky that I had the eyes that could move. Mm. Um, that was really helpful. But for me, having done that now for damn near 10 years, I guess, or maybe not 10 years, maybe eight years, um, it just has given me this really great sense of confidence in my physicality and my ability to kind of manipulate my body and, and do different things. So whether or not it's the way that Danny walks or the way that Yitzhak holds himself or the way that Jack sits or the way that Johnny shuffles or the confidence that Mike has, um, I, I always felt very confident that I was doing the right thing with my body. And I've learned that from Spider-Man. Yeah.
Nice. Um, it, it, Tom, was, was there a moment when you knew you wanted to act? Um, yeah, I guess there was. It was never something I wanted to do. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't like I was one of those young kids that's just yearning to be famous. I just used to love performing. I love dancing. I, I loved being creative. You know, the dance class I would go to on a Saturday, I think it was. My favorite part of the class was when the teacher would finish the choreo and then say, right, now you get to do your own choreo. And I would love like doing my own dances and stuff like that and, and being creative. I did Billy Elliot on the West End. It wasn't something we sought out to do. Someone asked me to audition. They spotted me at a show and was like, oh, you should audition. And as any young kid would, I was like, yeah, I'll try my best and see where I get. But it wasn't really until I was on set with Naomi Watts that I really started thinking of like, oh, wow, I could I could totally be an actor. But at that point, I still hadn't met my American agents yet. And then it wasn't until I was about 15, 16, where in the UK back then, you could decide whether or not you would go into further education or you would kind of stop there. And I just remember thinking like, I don't want to go to school. I want to be creative and I want to, you know, work and go and experience the world. And acting was kind of my ticket, ticket out of there. So it was more something that was a hobby that became a living you know, and I loved it. I love it today. And, and I really think I have the best job in the world, but it found me. I really didn't go out looking for it. What makes it the best job in the world? I think the people firstly is, is, is the highlight. You know, I'm really lucky that I have a team of people that I work with who are my best friends. I met them when I was 15 on a film years ago with Ron Howard. We've worked together on nearly every project and I just love being with them. I love creating with them. I love, you know, the memories of working on different films with them. I love traveling, experiencing new cultures, working with new people, reading new scripts, being creative, figuring out new characters, making shows like The Crowded Room, which is ultimately emotionally fulfilling, but also really educational you know I learned loads about mental health and and I read I read the book a book that I would never read like a 500 page book about therapy there's no way I would I read thrillers that's it and I learned so much about it and I, I really enjoyed it so there's so many elements to this job that I love and I feel so lucky to do it to the level that I get to do it. Um, and I just, you know, I'm loving it. Oh, and like you, you said, you sort of want an excuse to sort of stop doing education, but sort of acting has given you another way of education and another way of learning and like growing and all that. A hundred percent. Yeah. yeah awesome. I, I always feel like each, each new job feels like your first year of university. Yeah. Every, like you meet new pe people, you know, you're, you're fast friends with everyone. And, you know, you're learning. Like, I've got a film that I might do next year, which is, you know, vastly different to anything I've done before. And I'm just really excited to learn about what the world was like in that time. And, and uh, yeah, I'm excited. And so you talked about, like, particularly with Amanda, how important it was to have fun, um, even dealing with dark stuff in, in the ground room. This, it, it can be from anything you've ever worked on. Do you have just a moment of, like, just great, fun working on a project and acting just something that brought you just so much joy and just you had so much fun doing I mean it, it depends on what sort of what you're looking for I mean I remember the scene where Danny takes the stand mm. is the hardest thing I've ever done yeah from a logistical standpoint you know playing one person pretending to be another person while internally playing the person you're pretending to be who's arguing with the person that you're playing is a real fucking mind fuck like that is and I remember reading that scene and just sort of panicking trying to figure out how we were going to do that and I remember spending days with with Ben watching Jason's side of his coverage and mimicking our favorite take and being like right this is the take that we think will be in the show 
and mimicking it and mimicking it and mimicking it. And it was tough. It was really, I felt very vulnerable up there on the stand. It was almost like being on stage. And I know you asked me about having fun. Yeah. But I was loving it because I knew I was doing really good work. And I knew that what I was trying to achieve was, was happening. And as much as it was daunting and it was intense, and also I was crying my eyes out, I was I was really relishing in like my hard work paying off, which I just was, I was just really proud of myself. I just was really, really like, wow, I've, I really pulled my socks up and got on with this. Um, but then, I, you know, but then there's other times of having fun where like, I remember doing Chaos Walking with Doug Lyman. I have a video of me laughing for like, I think the video is like seven minutes, just because it was right at the end of the shoot. I was so tired. I was like deliriously tired. And in that film, we have we have this idea that there's this thing called the noise, which is like our thoughts that kind of exist around our face. And I guess I was supposed to be asleep in this scene or something. And Doug wanted me to like interact with the noise, but I thought he meant like as someone who was asleep like moving around in their sleep. So I was doing all these like grunts and stuff. And he was, he remember him saying over a microphone, like, wake up, Tom, you're not supposed to be asleep. And I don't know what it was about it, but it just tickled me in a way where I could not stop laughing. And they just let the camera roll. And, and there's moments like that where it's nothing to do with the creative and everything to do with just having fun with mates on set. Mm. Ah, well, Tom, it, like it's so cool seeing you on. Um, it's so cool seeing you on. Uh, on a television. As a big fan of TV, it's so cool to see you take on a TV show and see you develop a character over Thank ten. You. So that was really cool. Um, all the best of luck with the upcoming Screen Actors Guild Awards, Golden Globes. For the Thank you. We've got the Primetime Emmys, like in quite a way off, but you'll be eligible for that as well with this, with this work. So all the best for that. P watching this interview can go hey. to com to follow the awards coverage there. And Tom, just thanks so much for chatting. This is such a lovely conversation. Yeah. Thank you for waking up so early and uh, thanks for taking the time. I really enjoyed it.